guys, what's going on? It's Joshua with Think Liberty, and today we are joined by Patry Friedman. Patry is an activist and political and eco economic theorist, former executive director and current board chair of the Seasteading Institute, and also the son of David Friedman and grandson of Dr. Milton and Rose Friedman. How are you doing today, Patry? I'm doing great. Good, good. Well, let's start off. Uh, I like to ask my guests a little bit about their journey to liberty. Obviously, you're a third generation libertarian, uh, so so you've been with the movement, I'm sure, as long as you can remember. But um, was there was there any kind of different road or, or journey that you took um, to find it on your own? You know, actually, the funny thing was that um, in like middle school, I was kind of arguing libertarianism before I even knew the details about my family and like exactly what their positions were. Um, I just had this very strong intuition about like, this is right, this is right, you know, don't censor, don't take my property. Um, and then when I found out, uh, you know, all about my family, I was like, oh, okay. Um, and I've kind of evolved since then, I don't know, with a lot of thoughts about, okay, that's the society I want, but like, how would we get it? And, you know, how would it stay stable? And kind of all these questions where, like, I still have that idealism of, like, non-coercion is the society that I want, but I'm more skeptical about, well, you can't just write that down and make it happen. Like, you know, you, you need institutions and you need uh, checks. You need ways of balancing power in order to create that society. Nice. Oh, so, obviously, you know, I'm sure I'm sure you get asked all the time, but how similar are your views to, to your father's at, with respect to ANCAP philosophy? Do you draw from any other influences and how have these uh, influences your goals and, and activities? I would definitely say I'm influenced a lot by my dad, um, by mach both machinery of freedom and laws order. So uh, by specifically by ANCAP and the general idea of economic analysis of law. But, you know, there's actually a lot of my philosophy is based on this single paragraph in machinery of freedom. That's um, not exactly about ANCAP, but where, my dad tries to explain with a metaphor about how if you could switch protection agencies, how hard it would be for something like a war to happen. And he said, imagine if everybody lived in an RV and anybody could just up and vote with their house and somebody to try to try to declare war. They'd wake up the next morning and there would be a general and like five war journalists and everyone else would have moved to the next town over because nobody wants to be part of a war. And, you know, he meant that as a metaphor for ANCAP and I was kind of like, wait a second, I've been studying floating cities and on the ocean that could be literal, like cruise ships kind of are like living on RVs except having a building. And so a lot of my thinking is, is around the idea of like, well, um, the physical, these, this ability to switch governance provider, clearly that's going to be really powerful for making good law, making it a market, but the physical world matters too. And it may be hard to be able to have switching to many different legal providers in one place. So what if we build on the ocean where you could actually vote with your building? And when you switch, you're not just switching your virtual association of who your protection provider is, you're actually physically moving your land to a different place. And so kind of jumping off from there uh, is where a lot of my theories came from. And then um, even though I think that ANCAP, to me, it's, the most beautiful and elegant legal system. It's one that I'd love to see tried. I'm not positive that it would work. And I try to go to this higher level of saying, I don't know the best legal system. What we need is not for any one genius economist or philosopher to build a legal system. We need to create a robust market for governments where lots of people are trying lots of different things and we see what it looks like in practice. And maybe the freest place is gonna be like Singapore or something, it's gonna have like some really repressive laws, but that's what lets you have the freedom. Maybe it's gonna be a corporate run state where like, yeah, you cannot question the corporation, you have no freedom of speech there, but they give you more freedom than anyone else. Or maybe it'll turn out to be something like handcap. I don't know, but I know that I don't know. And I know that none of us know. And so we gotta try a bunch of stuff. Right, awesome. So, you know, getting a little bit into governments and stuff, what are your thoughts on the role of electoral politics in achieving a libertarian society? Well, I don't see much role of electoral politics in achieving libertarian society. I don't think there's none. I think that, um, you know, if you're in a swing state, for example, I think that a lot of people have very different opinions about whether Trump 
makes this country like more or less libertarian. Um, and, you know, without getting into that, regardless of which direction it is, clearly he's different. And if you were in a swing state, your vote mattered at making one of these two very different worlds, like politics as usual, or like crazy Trumpism. And so I think that there can sometimes be a role, but I, I come from a point of view, I mean, talking about laws, order, and other people who've influenced me is public choice economics, especially Mansur Olson. Um, and that, you know, we, at this point, we've got like 70 years of Nobel Prize winning economics about how democracies do not produce the best law for the best number, about how them being captured by special interests and over time getting captured more and more, building up kind of all of this resistance to good laws, decaying over time. Like we literally have multiple Nobel prizes and 70 years of economics saying that's what you expect to happen. And so I'm a strong believer in the idea that we like to, we like stories and we like movie plots and we like to blame bad things on bad people. And that's just not how large complex worlds work. It's about the incentives and we have great economics about how democracy has poor incentives. What we don't have it's very many ideas for systems which would have better incentives. You know, it really is true that um, it's not, it's a crappy system, but we don't have, have, have better ones. And so I, I think that there's very little you can do as far as running for government or voting that makes a difference, that the problems are systemic. And it's just, it's really hard for people to understand, um, you know, problems resulting from you in action, but not human design. We're just really bad at it. Um, but that's why I'm into competitive governance and seasteading the idea of, you know, as a programmer, even if we just step away from the economics as a programmer, I know you can only get so far by patching crappy old code. Like all progress in programming comes from eventually rewriting it from scratch, taking everything you've learned and rewriting it from scratch. And that is how you get progress. Absolutely. So obviously we're talking about, you know, governance and stuff like that. What, what popular rhetoric today do you think is the most threatening to liberty in your opinion? Um, and are you <laughs> concerned about the bordering on authoritarian discourse in some libertarian circles? I, I can't pick out what popular rhetoric is worse for libertarianism because there's just so much of it. I think what it comes down to is that most people are not libertarians. And that's just a fact that we have to accept about the universe. And most people do not pick their political beliefs based on you making a good argument, or you making an appeal to morality or not coercion. And I think that we just have to accept that and say in a world where most people have different priorities, um, most people would trade freedom for other things that they think are important. How do we get libertarian societies? And I, I do think this is a really wacky time for libertarianism, I mean, and for culture and politics in general. You know, we're, we're moving from a, a stable regime, um, you know, a bad, growing, dying dem democracy. But, you know, I, I wouldn't have said this 10 years ago, but uh, now I'm like, oh, crap, what's worse than a slowly dying democracy? Like, a, you know, a fast dying, like maybe going on fire democracy. Like, you know, it's <laughs> like, well, I wish I knew how good I had it. Um, right. So... Yeah, I think it's I think it's really creepy. And I mean, the movement towards uh, what I see as like a soft civil war in America. And this is not I mean, it, it's happening within the libertarian circle and between the traditional left and right, I think is really, really frightening. Like for all the it's like I it's like I took for granted the society that we had because I saw the problems with it. And you know what? There was actually a lot of good things. It was not libertarian, but it was it did let people of very different viewpoints live together, all see themselves as being all part of one society, America, and all dedicated to this common set of principles. And like, sure, that wasn't Libertopia, but it was actually pretty good. And like, now that it's like disappearing, you're like, wow, that's, it wasn't Real so fast. bad, you know? <laughs> yeah, we, we had this conversation the other day. We said, uh, it, who was it? Was it, oh, it was Will Coley, if you know who Will Coley is. He, uh, he ran for vice president um, in the libertarian uh, uh, primary. And he was saying, isn't it ironic that we're about to have our second civil war over the removal of statues from the first civil war? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's pretty uh, messed up. 
Yeah, it's 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 definitely a scary time. Uh, so we have a, a viewer question. Do you perceive a generational shift relative to uh, the Overton window? If so, what do you make of this? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think that, um, you know, and this is, I, I, I feel like I always want to blame things on the left. That's um, even though, you know, I have a lot of, um, you know, as a libertarian, I have a lot of social liberal viewpoints. Um, I feel like the left has kind of been in power in academia and like in the places that control thought and control what you're allowed to say uh, for a long time and that they kind of clamp down on a lot of types of discourse and, you know, eventually people just got tired of it. And I think that, you know, our, our evolved instincts are like, if the tribe casts you out, you die because that was the situation, right? And so our innate response to people like threatening to ostracize us uh, for our beliefs is kind of like, oh crap, you better not do that or you're gonna die. But the reality is if you have a job that you're not gonna get fired from, like you can find friends, you know, you can find a social life. So if you can support yourself, you actually can like piss people off and do horrible things, like things that people consider horrible that aren't illegal. And I think that eventually after like decades of that kind of soft um, coercion and soft like censorship and you can't say this, people are like, first of all, freaking sick of it. And second of all, are like realizing that kind of the emperor has no clothes. Like, yeah, if you can get fired from your job, you shouldn't say these things. But if you have your own your job where people don't care, that actually it's a big fat lie that you can't say certain things. And I think that's great. Because even though I don't believe that, all, I don't agree with all the things outside the Overton window, I think that we need to be able to talk about this stuff to find good answers. Yeah, absolutely. So let's uh, get into the Seasteading Institute a bit. Can you discuss how the Seasteading Institute came to be and what influenced your interest in such a project? Yeah, um, I guess it came from kind of being, I was in my early 20s. I felt like I was never going to be happy unless I could live in a libertarian country. Like I was just, it just like pissed me off to no end. And I had all of the kind of, you know, ambition and arrogance of someone who's like 22, 23, 24. And I was just like, fuck this. There's got to be some better way. And so I started studying like the, the nation founding movement and the floating city movement. And it was all a bunch of crazy people. But I was like, okay, this has been all crazy people, but like, there's something here. Like, if you could start a new country, that would be freaking awesome. And like, how else are we going to get a better way of living together? And so as I get started researching it more and more, I kind of realized that there were some things about the law of the sea that are really well suited to new jurisdictions, both the physical properties of being able to move buildings around and the way that international maritime law has this virtual association between like the flagging state and the vessel itself. And I started thinking there was really something there. And I wrote a book, uh, a free book online um, and gave some talks and eventually got hooked up with Peter Thiel. And he said, hey, let me fund this, um, make a nonprofit. So I started the Seasteading Institute and you know, I guess what changed from when I first got interested in the idea, I just wanted a place where I was happy to live, where I felt like this society is not just, you know, against my morals all the time. But, you know, what I realized is that I don't necessarily know how to design a society that I'd be okay living in. And that really it's about Nozick's utopia of utopias that what we need to do is, is change the world so that people can start countries. And then we don't need to know what the right one is. And we don't even need to all agree on it. If we can create that startup sector, then let a thousand nations bloom. Some of them will be way better. And so that's our, that's our mission. And, you know, we, we, it's been very easy to get press. It's been very easy to get people interested. Everyone loves a cool, sexy idea about a new utopia. Yeah. Settle the oceans. Woo. <laughs> and, so uh, you know, it's fucking hard is uh, actually building a floating independent city state. <laughs> but yeah, that's, um, uh, my, my next question to you was actually going to be what obstacles have you faced uh, in this project and have you, uh, how have you approached them? You know, what we found out from research, I mean, it's, it's hard to get donations is one thing. It's hard, been hard to get funding. So thank God for Peter Thiel. Um, 
you know, there's all this research about how when people fund charities, they kind of give to what makes them feel good and what their friends will appreciate. And so in politics, you find, I mean, you find a lot of people given to hospitals and schools and in politics, you find a lot of people given to mainstream political parties. And so, you know, we've operated on a, a shoestring budget compared to your Cato, you know, right. or something like that, even though we're trying to do something that would be a much more profound change. But fortunately, um, the big cost is actually building a floating city and not researching one. It doesn't cost that much to research one. And so we did a bunch of research on uh, the engineering designs, uh, the law, the legal regimes, um, the business models, and got a big list of people. And what we eventually came to was that the way to start was close to shore uh, with cooperation of a country as kind of like an offshore charter city. And that from an engineering perspective, it was way easier if we were away from big waves. From a legal perspective, it was the clearest legal status. You start that way, you build a bunch of them, you grow, and over time, you increase your autonomy. And so we decided that was the route. And we spent uh, years talking to countries. And just this year in January, we signed our first agreement with French Polynesia to try to build the first one of these off Tahiti. So we have a, an agreement. Um, it's, it's like a, a fir, it's an early stage agreement. It's like agreement one, but agreement two, which uh, we're hoping to do later this year is we're actually writing like the C zone act for them doing economic environmental impact analysis. They have picked the areas of land for us and we're hoping to sign that final deal like towards the end of this year and actually start building next year. So, you know, it's finally, finally seems to be happening and we've got interest from other countries. Honduras has a program that may or may not ever launch. I started working with them in 2011 um, and there are other people who are still working with them. That's on land, but it's a, a really good charter cities program where the cities get a ton of independence. Um, and other countries in French Polynesia have now expressed interest. So we've got other countries that we're talking to. So even if it doesn't work out in French Polynesia, there's these other South Pacific countries that are interested. So it seems like it's finally happening. And definitely the trends as far as people being dissatisfied with their government, Americans being dissatisfied, um, small countries being threatened by climate change, extreme storms, sea level rise, uh, and realizing that their sovereignty is actually one of their greatest assets and that they might be able to franchise out their sovereignty to, to charter cities or seasteads. Um, all of those global trends are kind of pushing to make this happen. Nice, nice. Yeah, and that this actually plays right into my next question as well. The, the Institute's efforts were discussed in the context of climate change in a recent CNN piece. To what extent is this truly a concern of yours or is this largely overlap with interest groups you've collaborated with? Um, well, you know, Seasteading is a big tent and there's a lot of people in it who have different motivations. Um, you know, is my fiance who actually first suggested the idea of working with these small drowning islands in order to help them be more resilient against climate change. My, my personal interest is this startup sector for governance, but, you know, we need a host nation and in business, you know, a deal is win-win, right? A good business relationship is they need something and you need something and you figure out how to help each other. And this, this sea level rise, you know, like we only need one country in order to prove this concept. And sea level rise is not a big problem for most countries, but there are a few countries where it's a really big problem. And those countries really care and they're really threatened and they're really motivated to uh, find ways to help their population survive. And, you know, a floating seastead, water goes up five feet, 10 feet, 20 feet. We don't care. You loosen the anchor lines and, uh, and that's it. <laughs> um, so I'm excited that, that we found this kind of win-win. Um, and it, you know, kind of remains to be seen. There's a lot of hype around environmental technologies. And I think that some of them will pan out and some of them won't. Uh, but ultimately, if that's what our host country wants, then that's what we're going to provide. Nice. How, how do you see sea studying evolving in the future and, and how might it m become more practical or affordable for regular folks? 
Yeah, I mean, when people ask me questions about seed setting, it's sometimes hard to answer because at different stages, it looks really different. I mean, the idea is you build this offshore floating island for a few hundred people, but the goal is like multiple million person city states. And those are really, really different. So the answers to a lot of questions are very different at those stages, but it's basically like, like any technology is we're gonna start being near to shore with the cooperation of a host country with limited autonomy. In the case of French Polynesia, um, basically they have autonomy delegated from France. Anything that they have autonomy for, they're allowed to subcontract to us so we can negotiate for them to kind of carve out for us governance that they have. And then over time, if that works out, we can then go to France to get carve outs of things that France is in charge of, which is more difficult, but, but not impossible. So that's one way in which our autonomy can grow over time. Of course, we're gonna grow in size. I'd love to grow in number of sites, especially number of sites in different countries. Like the whole point of this is competition. Uh, and I'll feel much safer like when we have multiple sites in multiple countries and regions of the world. Uh, and then we just, we wanna grow in size, grow in number of places in the world, grow in autonomy and grow in like physical independence. So move out of protected waters into deeper waters and eventually be big enough and have the engineering designs where we can kind of go out on a seamount in the middle of the ocean um, and have only a loose association with the host country. Even then we'll probably have like a virtual association with a country uh, at the beginning. And then, you know, when, when, a, when a seastead is bigger than 10% or 15% small, of the smallest countries, then I think it makes sense to, to talk to countries in the UN about being independent. But that's, that's kind of the progression. It has to start somewhere. And, and the hardest thing seems to be getting started. And that's why I'm totally psyched that we finally seem to have a foothold. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So in the context of your two main projects, uh, Future Cities and Seasteading, um, in, in what way does the concept of, of polycentric law play into your vision? Well, you know, there's different ways of thinking about it. Um, you know, I started out being really interested in polycentric law within a region the classic ANCAP model. And I think there's some really beautiful uh, law and econ arguments for why it would tend to produce laws that maximize the kind of total utility uh, weighted by money, which is imperfect, but still uh, in a way that other political systems don't. But I think over time I've come to say, see that the, the real issue is not competing legal systems within one area, like before we can even get to that, we need to think about competing legal systems in the entire world. And that's been kind of my focus, you know, seasteading is a method, but like my theoretical work and my evangelism and interest is around this general idea of competitive governance. The idea that you can analyze government as an industry and you can say, what are the barriers to entry? Well, they're incredibly high. You need to start a revolution in order to start a new firm. That's ridiculous. What is the cost of switching? I can just call up T-Mobile and switch to Verizon. That's easy. But to switch countries, I have to like sell my house, leave my job, leave my friends, go get all of those things again. That's incredibly high. What happens when you have an industry with where it's really hard to start new firms and it's really hard to switch firms? you get really shitty customer service and everybody miserable. Like, of course, we don't have to get into democracy. We don't have to get into the non-coercion principle. We can just take this like dispassionate, like almost like a financial analyst or an economic analyst and be like, yeah, of course an industry like this is gonna be terrible. Of course people are gonna hate it. We see across lots of industries, the less choice you have, the less startups there are, the less competition there is, the shittier the product. And government has is like the worst for that. And so, I take the polycentric approach at that higher level of the industry and say, okay, we need to make it so that people can start more countries, so that people can switch countries more easily, um, so that people unbundle like different services that they get from their country and make that market more competitive. And then countries will serve people better without us figuring out like the right philosophical principles or the exact way to write a law or the institutions just by changing those incentives. 
Nice. Yeah, absolutely. So, so I mean, you don't imagine that it would these strategies would, would result in just like an ANCAP market libertarian society. You kind of envision the likelihood for a, a panarchic organization to emerge. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think that that ANCAP is um, it's one neat system that a bunch of people are into. But if we have a true market for governance, then people are going to start a bunch of countries that work a bunch of different ways. And honestly, like. I hope somebody starts in Kapistan, but I'm not going to like be in the first population that moves there. You know, I got, I got family, I got kids. I'm more likely to move to like your Google topia, you know, or something, <laughs> or like your like Singapore West, Singapore East or whatever. I'll, I'll go to Kapistan for, for you. Awesome. <laughs> I, I'm going to be very interested in what happens there. I'll go to their like opening festival. You know, I don't want to talk to like the legal theorists. I want to talk to the people, the protection agencies who are writing a law. I mean, totally fascinating, but um, that's not where I'm going to live at first. And so I think there's room for a whole spectrum of different societies. I mean, look, like libertarians, anarchists, we all agree that if you choose a set of laws to be bound by, even if that set of laws is not ANCAP or not libertarian, that that's okay. It is your right to contract into a system of government. So it's clearly moral. And I think that they're intriguing as I find ANCAP. I think that doing new things is really hard and that there's other ways of organizing society that we have a lot more evidence for being stable and being functional. And so I think there should be a bunch of countries that do the old traditional thing that are like corporate states or are like, you know, run Lee Kuan Yew style, um, you know, or other like crazy, like ultra democracies where everybody votes on everything. I'm definitely not going to live there, but, you know, go for it. I, I think we have evidence that there are a bunch of forms of government that work um, and evidence that 100 million person democracies don't. And so I think that along with trying like really cool new systems like ANCAP, I think the world will also benefit from just a bunch of like well-run, boring countries. I mean, let's just take Switzerland, like without changing anything. Like I'd be really happy if there was like Switzerland's in more hemispheres. Doesn't need to be any different. Let's just take more of those. So like, the, you know, there's room in a startup sector for doing things a lot of different ways. So let's try the crazy new things, but like, let's also do the old things that work. Cause we're not even fucking doing those. Right. Exactly. And this, you know, this next question might be, you know, something that you have to answer from pure speculation, but how do you suppose interactions between individuals amongst varying social orders would play out? Do you think uh, there'd be conflicting legal systems causing confusion? And... Do you mean in like a competitive governance world? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess I would I would call it the same issue that you have in ANCAP, but like weaker because instead of having a bunch overlapping the same geographic area, you're like going say from one seastead city state to another one, and so there's less different laws and there's this clearer transition where like okay, you land at the airport, maybe you got to take a test on like the local legal system before they let you get off the plane or get out of the airport, right? Like the same kinds of things that you could do to warn people when there's like many legal systems close together, you can do to warn people when there's different legal systems far apart. I mean, I think there, I think there are going to be wacky things that happen where somebody has no idea that this is the law in this place and they, you know, get off the plane and violate the law. But if the laws are reasonable, then there's not going to be things that you can do that are just easy to do and have huge consequences. And if there are, that better be in like, the, the test that you have to take before you get out of the airport. Um, but uh, it will be harder. It will be more complicated. But I mean, we have some of that now. I mean, look at Singapore, look at people getting, uh, you know, getting caned for dropping gum. I would say like getting like whatever, getting caned. Like, yeah, it sucks. I don't want to get caned. But like if you mess up and break the local law, and something happens to you that's like completely survivable, you know, just deal with it. That's how their society works. I do think that if, if somebody does something that seems totally reasonable and it's like the death penalty, you know, or life in jail, I think there are going to be like their state is probably going to come in and bring pressure and there are going to be like negotiations and people saying like, okay, maybe you can do that to your citizens, but you have to have like some slack for people who are new and don't understand all the rules. I mean, 
we'll work all that out. But you know what? Like, I'd love to be in the world where those are the problems, right? It's like figuring out the different legal systems and go to place from place to place and figuring out how to best warn and inform people about like this radically different set of laws. Like, awesome. <laughs> like, I'll take those problems over everything working like shit. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, that's pretty much the end of the interview. Of the interview. Uh, what, what books are you currently reading, fiction, nonfiction, et cetera? I've become very interested lately in like in Greek philosophy and Stoicism. So I'm reading Epictetus and Marcus Aurelius. Um, I'm also reading Maria Kondo, The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up. Um, as far as fiction, my favorite thing lately is called The, the Three-Body Problem. Uh, by, by Chikshin Liu, it's Chinese science fiction. It's the first translation to ever win a Hugo for best novel. And it's really neat because it's a totally different way of thinking than our science fiction. Like it's, it's very non-progressive, we'll put it that way. It's much <laughs> more like, you know, hardcore, like not everybody is nice. Like not everyone in the universe is just gonna be nice to each other. Like right. it's gonna be just a badass struggle for existence. It's kind of like um, reality. <laughs> kind of like reality, yeah. Almost like the evolutionary struggle that produced us. Um, yeah. So it's it's a really it's a really neat antidote to just kind of reading the same old themes. Awesome, awesome. Well, do you have uh, any websites or events you'd like to send people to in the near future? Yeah, check out uh, seasteading.org. That's our seasteading website. Sign up for our mailing list, Twitter, Facebook, etc. Buy our book. It's you know just out the last few months from Simon and Schuster. If you ping us your receipt, I'll sign your book. Um, and all, we did a conference in Tahiti uh, with the senior government ministers and entrepreneurs. We had people like Tony Shea from Zappos. Uh, the talks are all up online. We don't have our next public conference scheduled yet, but the first conference was was awesome. And if you're kind of skeptical, like, is there really a country that's gonna like do this? That's gonna like let you build like a wacky new city? Like, is this for real? Um, watch these videos and you'll see that like, you know, it, if you go to the right place with the right people who are willing to try something new and whose country, you know, needs new answers, um, you can actually do this. So see setting that awesome. awesome. Well, thanks again for coming on Pottery and thank you guys for checking us out. Make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel at Think Liberty TV. Check us out on Facebook at thinkliberty.tl and the website at think-liberty.com. Thank you again, Patry. We really look forward to what you do in the future, and, and we'll be watching. All right. Thanks for having me.